Hey guys, this is a little bit different video. This is what we're calling an Overlander Profile. We're going to sit down with Austin and Leah and talk about their epic adventure to South America. So sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee, and listen to them tell their story. Enjoy. Today we're coming to you from Kaibab National Forest just on the rim of the Grand Canyon. Today I've got Austin and Leah and these guys are known as Forerunner for Adventure on Instagram. You on Facebook too? Yes. Yeah we do have Facebook. a Facebook page. Okay, cool. yeah. Alright so tell us a little bit about your big adventure. Um, but first I'd like for you to kind of just introduce yourself. I mean Okay. Who are you? What do you do? Where do you live? All that good stuff. So I'm Leah and I grew up in Arizona and I grew up not being a camper at all. I love the outdoors and I love hiking. Um, went to college up at NAU, met this wonderful man and uh, we moved to Denver and um, continued to, for my love of the outdoors but uh, again didn't do like a whole lot of camping so for a trip like ours um, was definitely a, a big change for me, so, um, yeah. And I'm Austin Johnson, and I also grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, and I did grow up camping a lot. My, uh, my family, we had a cabin up in Sholo area, and so I spent pretty much every single weekend from about April to November in a forest pretty much just like this. So, um, I have a a great love and an appreciation for the outdoors and I've always had it and probably always will. Alright, so my first question is where did your grand adventure take you? So our journey started in Denver, Colorado and we left home on Halloween night. That's when we moved out of our house and started our journey back to our parents and families in Arizona and from then we we uh, stayed around for a couple of weeks, said our goodbyes, finished up some last minute trip prep. And um, November 21st, we headed into Mexico. And we eventually worked our way all the way to Ushuaia, Argentina, or Tierra del Fuego, the end of the road mm -hmm. in uh, South America, as far as you can drive. And uh, we took eight months. Eight months. We spent about a month in Mexico, about four months in Central America. Yep and then another four months in South America. And uh, we were planning on a little bit longer, but uh, you know, with the seasons being opposite, we kind of, we ran into winter and we also wanted to come back home and do the East Coast while we still had a chance. So it was a good, uh, a good little push at the end, but we eventually made our way back to Montevideo, Uruguay, shipped the car to Miami, Florida, picked the car up, and uh, continued up the East Coast, made it to Quebec, Canada, mm -hmm. came back into um, Buffalo, New York, yep. after looking at Niagara, and then we headed back home to Arizona because it was winter time. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's, that's quite the run now. How long were you actually on the road? 366 days. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's that's amazing. We Perfect. shot for a year, and we wanted to make sure that we hit just over that year mark. Yep. So. Gotcha. Well, we awesome. did it. Yeah. Yep. We, did we it. counted it at 365, but then my sister reasoned us into technically it was 366. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the official gotcha. word. Now, as far as uh, planning for something like this, how long did you actually take to plan this adventure? So when Austin first came to me with a picture from a blog of uh, the Uni Salt Flats in Bolivia, from that moment, like maybe two weeks or three weeks, we, you know, I was like, I don't know if this guy is being serious or not. I mean, and uh, but from that point, it took us two years to save um, before we actually left for the trip. 
Um, and one thing, like we ended up, we decided that we weren't going to use any of our current savings to do the trip. So that's why it took two years to just save. It wasn't until about six months before we actually left though, that we were like, are we really doing this? Um, yeah, six be months before we left, we actually said, okay, in six months time is the perfect time for us. We were at our savings marks. Um, she was going to be done with school. And at that point we were, it would have been the perfect time in our life to go. So we did. Yep. And also the perfect weather on the trip. That was a big, a big plan factor for us was making sure that we were going to be able to leave and be in Central America in a good time of year that we weren't there in the rainy season and experiencing you know bad weather yeah. now what exactly led you to make this decision what what made you decide okay let's just take two years of our lives pour our heart and soul into some savings and then <laughs> go for another year so basically three years of your life were dedicated to this process what was the driving factor just uh sense of adventure really um we kind of leah was at a a very good job um it was just kind of it wasn't enough for her i wasn't very happy in my career at the time it was it was fulfilling but it was a it just wanted something more um i have always had a, a huge passion for the outdoors so being inside an office and doing that really it it begged me to to move on and and seek something more really and I feel like I mean just to add on I it was so out of this world like I'm you know I, ne I could have never have dreamt the idea that I would one day drive to the tip of South America and it felt like a true challenge um, I love challenges and so uh, and we were just you know we we didn't own a home uh, we were in careers that were really good to us, but you know, weren't crazy fulfilling. And we said, you know, we can be on this trajectory for the rest of our lives and we could retire and do it, or we could try to do it now. Um, there's no sense in, I mean, what, what do we have to lose? And, uh, the question that answer or the answer to that question was nothing. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, it was just a sweet time in our life to, uh, to step aside and, and do something for ourselves, really. Right. So that was uh, that was pretty much the, the big motivation behind it. Also, I I had always I had a long time dream of driving to Panama and back. And Leah, she wanted to join the Peace Corps and do some stuff in South America. So she was always enamored by South America, and uh, really when I had shown her this blog and it kind of clicked for me, well, if I'm going to go halfway, we might as well do the full bit. So we, we really just kind of went on with it and, and you know, the world is accessible. It's, it's big, but it's, it's all right there. So you just kind of have to go for it. All right. So tell us about your rig that we have sitting behind you here. What all, uh, what all, have you, first of all, what your model is it? And then tell us about some of the modifications that you've done to it to get it roadworthy for South America. <laughs> First off, you have to ask us about the name. This, the rig has a name. It has a name. All yeah. right. This here, this is old blue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, blue is our 2004 Toyota 4Runner. It's a SR5 version, so pretty much completely unloaded, and you know, it's a. Uh, Got some suspension modifications. Aside from that, it's very much stock, um, all stock motor. We don't really have anything done to it. Um, lift wheels and tires. We have got a homemade bumper put on it. I built some drawers in the garage for the inside so we can have better storage. Took one of the seats out. Um, kind of homemade a roof rack and we have a rooftop tent on the top of it. and. That's pretty much what makes it our adventure mobile. It's, it suits every need that we pretty much have. So, yeah, and we live very comfortably in it. Yeah. We just we just passed one seventy eight. Oh wow! So awesome. it's getting up there, but yeah, for the last seventy eight thousand miles, it's been the perfect car. We uh, yep. we almost never have any issues with it. Knock on wood, but um, 
Yeah. Best thing about speaking a Toyota. Of, uh, speaking of mechanical issues, did you have any mechanical issues while you're on your trip in South America? The only issue we had was um, I had two tie rods go out on us, and that was just you know probably a lot of really nasty potholes that I should have slowed down for, and a couple other things. Uh, what do you want to say about the back bumper? Oh yeah, and then the back. <laughs> Very close to the end of our trip on the Route of 40 in Argentina. A very long, dirt, paved, whatever mixed highway. We had the back bumper break off on us. So that went right up there on the top of the uh, roof rack and spent the rest of the trip up there until we got back to the U.S. We made it to Atlanta, found a welder, and he fixed it on up for us. So what did you eat on your trip? That one varies drastically. Yeah. Um, really, our our favorite country for food happens to be Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, for us, it's it's one of the only countries that we feel they use the entire spectrum of every food group, where you can you know get the poultry, the meats, the fish. They use all the vegetables. Um, they use almost everything. Yeah, I mean, there's just definitely a lot more spices and just uh, overall Flavors. a better, well-rounded group of food um, in Mexico. Whereas, like Argentina, we couldn't find a vegetable. We could find them. We could find a vegetable in the markets, but like if we were to go out to dinner, they don't serve vegetables ever. Um, and so, like we were on like a total protein diet in Argentina. Yeah. Meat, meat, meat. It was typical that you would go into a restaurant in Argentina and um, typically it was, you'd see a large table of people and there'd be wine and a big old tray of meat. And that's the only thing you'd see on their table. And even, even for us, we would order a salad or something like that and they'd set it on the edge of the table like we just ordered it to order it. And yeah. it's, it's just really funny, they don't eat the vegetables. Um, that you can you can buy them you can find them but for the most part when you're going out it's you know you're it's it's a meat protein restaurant but maybe a better answer to your question uh so we did obviously a lot of home cooking and that could have just varied drastically kind of what we would make every night here um so different pasta and meat and rice and all of that um our favorite couple for cooking um, with is Niels and Ninke from the Netherlands. They made us the most amazing meals every night we were with them. And from our scratch. Deal, everything from scratch. Everything from scratch. And um, like French onion soup, you know, cut like it was just amazing. Um, they made us empanadas on this crazy rainy night. We had tarps up and it was for our anniversary and they made not just like one variety of empanada, it was three varieties. Um, and so just the love and the time that it took, they really made me remember and appreciate cooking and what it means to, And the you fact know. that they would do it on an old petrol Coleman stove. <laughs> yeah. Everything, that was the only stove they had, they were very, very basic camp setup, but they would cook everything gourmet meals with just basic camp camp setup and is actually is it was great. And um, then the but, last thing I wanted to say about that, like about food. So um, our refrigerator went out in Colombia. It stopped working. And I thought, you know, how are we like you know, this is drastic. This is going to drastically change our trip. Not sure how yet, but I mean, f- our eating habits will have to change. Um, and they did, but they definitely changed for the better. Um, we ate, you know, there are tons of markets along the way. So food wasn't like, it, you know, it wasn't hard to find. And the other thing we were worried about was ice. Um, so rather than like stress about buying a bunch of groceries, we just went daily. Um, yeah. And that's kind of carried on to our life here, which, if you we know. Were gonna, if we were going to go out for a couple of days, we would typically just have a protein that we could cook that night. Yeah. And then we would do some vegetable options the next couple of nights. So it was, you know, just kind of using using what you have and really eating more healthy, not over-purchasing, 
and overall it you know, and like our, no waste really yeah I mean, we would very rarely have and any that was waste. the thing with the cooler we were always we're always throwing stuff oh out. well let's just get a cucumber we'll do something with it yeah maybe we'll make some sandwiches for lunch and then five days later the cucumber is gross in the bottom of the cooler and it's like all right we gotta throw that away oh well we got these eggs that we probably kept too long. So if you're debating whether or not to get a refrigerator, I definitely think it's very nice and I would not turn one down. However, it was not a was not trip an, ender like yeah. we thought it might be. <laughs> because we did meet a lot of other traveling couples that didn't have them. Right. and mm -hmm. Or had them work. in a very small scale, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so how were the border crossings i mean what what were some of your experiences there both both good and and bad so, so we, um, let me just say let me just say that we don't i think it's important to say that we don't speak a lot of spanish so like for any traveler out there who's very nervous you know we did it <laughs> it can be done and the biggest like i'll say what my biggest piece of advice is and austin can say what his is but um time and attitude if you go in thinking that you've got to get through a border in an hour, good luck to happen. you. I mean, you're going to be stressed out and freaking out and you're not going to get very good help. And that's generally, I mean, you, it's a good approach to life. <laughs> um, but we just, we always made sure that we were there early and that we could, if we had to, we were going to spend a day there. Um, so with that being said, what, what, what would you say is? Oh, you, you took mine. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, that's the one I always say, so yeah. it's rubbed off on you. Yeah. No, um, it, we, we learned that time is your, your biggest asset when it comes to border crossings. Yeah. Um, we had talked to a Swiss couple who's been all over the world, and that was the one piece of advice they gave us. We met them in Mexico, so it was very early in the trip. And he said, you know, depending on where you are in the world, it might take you a couple of days to get across the border. And so sometimes you're stuck in the in-between. And most of the time they don't want to work all night long. So, you know, if you say, okay, I'll stay here. That's fine. I'll just stay right over here. But you guys, you know, you guys are going to have to work all night long. And someone for security is going to have to be here. So the security guard is going to be pushing to get you guys through as well. But really, um, yeah, time and just having a good attitude and not trying to be too stressed out because border crossings are extremely stressful. Um, in Central America, they are, there's a lot of the, the money handlers running around yep. and there, there's a lot of people there's that do. There's helpers. There's helpers that are trying. They'll they'll say, um, you know, well, they're, they're fixers. Yeah, come with me. If you pay me a little bit of money, uh, I'll get you through that border really fast. Um, and for us, I mean, it was very important that we did not um, pay any bribes. We thought that that just was not going to be what we were going to do on this trip. Um, we, you know, that really perpetuates uh, what. People hear, you know, from the U.S. side and you hear, oh, you got to pay so many people off. Well, it's not that they're not going to accept money, um, but if you don't pay them, you know, you don't an, need to pay a bribe. If it's not an option, then yeah. you're not going to have to worry about it. Right. They'll pick up on it. And, and we only once really at a border crossing kind of were asked for a bribe. And it happened to be when we were with our uh, friends from the Netherlands. And what it was was the guy said oh well it cost four dollars for the inspection and we had the piece of paper that the aduana had given us to go to the cops to give us the inspection and ninke was looking at this thing and she, it doesn't say four dollars in here show me where it says four dollars and the guy oh never mind never mind it's not four dollars <laughs> i take that back and so that was the only kind of possible bribe that we were asked for but it is so minuscule that it didn't necessarily even matter but and so much of our trip relied on iOverlander, the app. And so I encourage anyone uh, to download that because especially for the border crossings, people are providing real time updates basically of you know, what the expectation is, what the process is, if it's closed, if it's open. Um, so that really, I mean, we lived and breathed by that because uh, we just, we. We, we, to, we knew what to expect and it really didn't divert. We knew if it was going to be a busy border crossing or if it was going to be a small, yeah. very remote border crossing. And sometimes that does, that does differ because the remote ones, sometimes you're through like that. And sometimes 
it's oh well you got to wait for tomorrow for the supervisor to get here yeah <laughs> yeah and uh, the big ones are always they just kind of go typically two hours was about normal for us to get across the border so but it's very easy it's 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 almost always the same the same steps to get across every single time it's you know you you go with your vehicle permit and your passport and for Bolivia we needed a a visa ahead of time but it's just you know doing your research knowing what the the basic steps are which are pretty much always the same and then just kind of going through the motions and being and, respectful and I mean if you're going to try to smuggle something in like good luck to you I, I mean that would be very stressful and you're going to encounter problems that way and there was some issues you know with pets and whatnot you know there are different rules and different expectations with pets and um, so just making sure that you've got everything but um, you know from our perspective we didn't have any troubles and um, if you've just followed the rules you shouldn't have any problems and a good attitude and a smile go a really long way okay so talking about border crossings and all in our culture there's a, there's a general fear about traveling south of the border all we ever hear about are you know the bad things what would you say to that perception what you know if you're talking to the general public like what was your perspective when you traveled south of the border were those fears warranted or do you think that they're exaggerated you know i don't know if it is if it's exaggeration i just think that the worst stories that there's probably some truth to it or you know that they really did happen but you're only hearing part of the story um most of the time what we would hear is you know these people got in trouble because they were buying drugs or they were you know out late drinking and started a fight yeah. in all of those all those things happen here in the United States mm -hmm. and I was just um, we were both ju we were definitely trep like nervous um, but what was so special about like going across those borders was how welcoming everyone is and you're almost immediately put at ease and thinking yeah okay like I'm guessing that if we want to find trouble we'll find it mm -hmm. um, but if we you know and, the, and typically the the citizens are looking out for you um, not that we ever had this issue but there was there was a couple travelers that we had met and they were either traveling in van or motorhome or something like that and they would stop on the side of the road because it's getting dark and you just don't travel at nighttime it's kind of unsafe mm -hmm. um, and so they would pull over somewhere and very soon after they had stopped someone a family would stop come over in their vehicle and say hey it's not safe for you to be here come over to my my property it's fenced it's this and you can stay there you can stay with us all night long um and so really the people the people are looking out for you and they want you to be safe because they're happy that you're in their country they they want the tourism they want you know they want a good reputation and they know that this is something people do all the time um we kind of thought when we were getting into the whole traveling thing that you know, like there's not many people that do it. We met so many people on the road. It's it's amazing how many travelers, especially from Europe and you know, Canada, mm -hmm. that they are on the road. And you know, there's there's so many people out there doing this. But the people in those countries, they really want you to be safe. And really, what it boils down to is, if you're looking for trouble, you can find it anywhere. Chicago is no more safe than one of the worst Central America countries. And yeah, bad things happen everywhere. But if you have a good mind about it and you're very cognizant about your surroundings, you're not necessarily going to run into trouble. Um, I mean, yeah, bad things can happen to good people, but if, if you're you know in a good mindset and this and that, you're not going to have much issue. And like Austin said, just to reiterate, like we did take certain precautions. We never drove at night, just not just because like bad people, but animals, um, cars that, you know, either don't have working running lights or they're drunk drivers. So just those things. Um, and we were very, I mean, blue was our home. And so we took it very seriously about where we left the car. 
um, and what was in there. And um, so we'd, I mean, if we were gonna go in a city, we would make sure that we paid someone to watch it, you know, or made sure that it was in a, as safe as a lot as you can get, you know. In a very visible spot or with a police officer or a security guard standing. And not to say that those people couldn't have broken into the car too, but you know, they didn't. And mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have any issues with that at all, but that was something we took very seriously. I mean, I mean, probably, I mean, I think if, even when we were in the U.S., we were on high alert um, because, again, this is our home. And so, uh, you know, if something were to happen to it, that was going to change our trip. So uh, we took that very seriously. Yeah. And also kind of to go with that, it, obviously people see the vehicle as something that is more than what a lot of their vehicles are, but not having, you know, like, the big wheels and tires and just making it look as normal as possible was also kind of a key for us and you know just not to stick out just keeping it as basic as possible and yeah. not looking gaudy like you have excess money to throw around because then that's it's just pulling more attention and you already get attention so next question okay. where did you poop <laughs> That's always a popular question, so you know, it's different for every culture and, and location. So what was that like for you guys? What, what, what yes. lessons did you learn? So pretty much on the trip, we, we very much tried to find places that were um, secure for us. Um, so whether that be someone's property or um, a hostel, um, all, all different types of places that would uh, have basic amenities for us, but almost always there's a, a toilet available. Granted, a lot of times they're very disgusting and nothing is provided for us, but we almost always had a toilet available to us. Surprisingly, like I, we were geared up, like ready to not have that option. Um, but definitely one of our like critical items because just because they have a toilet does not mean that a toilet seat will be there or toilet paper or anything else. Yeah, toilet seats are a big one. Toilet seats are... 50% of the time they're not there. Right. So with that <laughs> being said, like we always carried our poop bag, you know, our toiletry bag. And um, we carry a roll of TP for us, mm -hmm. a thing of wet wipes. Yep. And also... I think a hand sanitizer, so we're pretty much set to to clean up any situation. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm going to start wrapping this up, but just really quickly, I'd like for you to share one of your favorite highlights of the trip, whether that's an incredible location or experience, and, and then I'd like you to share the opposite. Okay. You want to go for your favorite? Yeah. Well, we got engaged in Bolivia. <laughs> and uh, to make that story short, I mean, Austin and I have been together for... Uh, six years at the time. Six years at the time. And, uh, you know, one thing that I probably didn't even... I don't know if I expressed this or not, but I really wanted the moment to be between us um, in a place that was special it, but I would I really wanted it to have been captured so that we could have shared it with family and he did all of that and it was <laughs> amazing and it was like at a time where we were both really stressed out with each other it was, and, probably, it was our most negative moment with each other on the trip yeah we were, we were both really at each other's we were just stressed and, out yeah, yeah. Um, but for, for that moment in particular, it was kind of, um, it was the first time the feel of the, uh, the area was like home in Arizona where we're both from. So it was the first time where we were like, wow, this is, this is magical. There's saguaro cactus and, um, it's very deserty feeling and, um, yeah. And even though Tierra de Fuego was our, de you know, our goal, um, the salt flats was what initially Austin had showed me the picture of. And so it really, it was such a special place, a special time. Um, and to have captured that, you know, un unbeknownst to me was really, really, really cool. Uh, so that was definitely my, my favorite. Um, my favorite probably, oh, there's so many wonderful moments. Um, 
I think one of my favorite times was in Colombia. Um, we had decided to drive up to the top of a mountain to try and camp on it. And uh, we get to this one spot after driving for probably three or four hours along this really kind of a rough trail going all the way up. And this is coming from pretty much coastline. Um, and this mountain just rises up right off of the coast. And we're in very foggy, very low visibility. And the sun is kind of setting. And we get to this open spot where it's just like on the side of this this big mountain and it opens up and drops off and you look out and you see just this nice orange glow and you realize that that's actually the water reflecting off of the Caribbean side of uh, of the the water in Colombia and you look closely and you can see all these little fishing boats down there stringed out and it's just kind of one of those things where it's like this is just incredible how can we how can you not just remember this for the rest of your life and and to try and capture it is is difficult because it's it's one of those situations where you're going from really a nice cool off-road trail no visibility and then all of a sudden bang you have this beautiful sunset amazing view and it's just one of those moments that you just have to really think about and never forget um worst moments my worst moment is so silly because it doesn't even sound that bad but i feel like our, our you know any bad moment in life is probably when you're tired and maybe even hungry or whatever you're just not at your best self and it had been raining like three days we had we were camped basically in mud and i'm just like oh, oh, oh that was anymore. and but we didn't even get muddy like it just but i i think it was just being tired and stressed out for no good reason. And that honestly, that's just the one moment that I just remember crying for no good reason. And uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and the hard thing about finding a, a bad portion of the trip is really, it, it's a mixed bag of tricks really because you, ha you, have, you have something that's incredible and then there's like a slightly negative aspect to it, but you're you're in a completely foreign place and you're experiencing so much beauty and everything else. And there's so many positive sides to every day that it's like, okay, I think really one of the worst, one of the worst times I ever had was, this probably isn't even the worst, but uh, one that sticks out is we were on um, Lake Nicaragua and we were gonna camp next to this police station it was it was windy and we had walked off into town and we had we had set the <laughs> this car this is your worst moment <laughs> we had set the car and uh, we didn't fold it out because we were going to go into town so we just parked next to the police station in this field and then we walked off into town and it had gotten increasingly more windy and we come back and there's was it mosquito yeah it was mosquitoes and uh all next to the lake here and we we're pretty much you know 100 yards from the edge of the lake but the mosquitoes were so bad that there was thousands of them Swarm. and they were vortexing on the low pressure side of the car <laughs> and so they're just uh, it's hard to thousands describe. of yeah. them just like you can see them and it's like oh man we, we are we, not camping we here. We cannot camp here tonight. <laughs> so now we it's it's almost dark. We've been in town for four or something hours. Yeah. What are we going to do now? And we ended up, uh, since we were close to this little town, we just decided that was one of the first nights we actually stayed at a hostel, yep. not in the vehicle. And uh, so, so we went to this hostel, but we had to drive through a market at the same time. And, mm -hmm. you know, then to get into this guy's hostel is like a one lane street that's completely overpacked with the market and so you're driving trying not to run people over people are moving things out of the way of the car so you can actually drive through and then you have to turn and then back up in so like someone has to completely move their whole market to their neighbor's market so you can nose the car and then back up into this guy's driveway it's stressful yeah and then there's a guy trying to tell me that i ran over his bike 
but I didn't even hit it. And we just we just closed the door for the gate. And, and we said, "See ya." Yeah. <laughs> um, but that, yeah, that, that's it's the mixed bag of tricks where because you know you can you can take a negative turn on things, but really it's you know there's just so much so much wonderful parts of every single day that you just you just have to focus in on it and take yeah. it for what it is. Now for one of my last questions. <laughs> this is the one I didn't prep you for. Yeah. How how do you think you've developed as a team as compared to when as compared to before you went on your adventure to after? What what were some of the lessons you learned as a couple on this adventure? That's a good question. So someone before asked us, what did you learn about your partner that you didn't know before? Um and we've been together for so long and we we really do spend a lot of time together um <laughs> but um really the thing that i think really came brought us together a little bit better is that we we are very we communicate our feelings to each other so it's um every every part of every day we kind of talk about things and when one of us isn't feeling good we we do really cater. I mean, some days I need to really pick up the slack and some days Leah will do more, but we, we really fell into a routine of, we kind of have our own chores and we, we just, we, we work so well together that it's a, uh, it's pretty amazing. I mean, before and after the trip, I think it's just, you know, we're just a little bit closer as a team. We, you know, yeah, I don't think that there were any major aha moments other than me just being on the daily and really impressed with him as a human being. <laughs> and I mean, I always pride, like one thing growing up, my mom talked a lot about be having a positive attitude. And so, and for me, when I surround myself with people, it's really important to have a positive attitude. And so, cause when, when someone's negative, I just can, I, I, I get attracted to that and it can bring you down so fast. Um, and Austin's ability to stay positive in the most horrendous <laughs> um, moments. And um, I also do think like one thing that really surprised me, um, I really feel like I needed the most help on the trip in some ways and just needed kind of the most caring and to let someone do that for you. Well, A, to have someone that was willing to but also who you know could um that was really hard for me because i i do i've always been pretty independent um austin drove the whole way um not that i couldn't but uh, you did drive the one little section on the day after we were coming off of that mountain yeah and i about lost my mind yep he about she lost almost his drove mind. off the edge but she didn't I did not. <laughs> but um, you know, I... What was your positive outlook on that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the old shit bar? <laughs> the positive outlook was that we didn't go over the edge. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We made it out alive. Yeah. But I think that, that, I mean, for the most part, there wasn't any major aha moments. It was just a really nice reassurance that you've got a really great partner uh, in life as a friend and you know it's more than that so yeah it really i think it just it kind of affirmed that we are we're yeah we're, she's we're the meant perfect to, person we're meant to be and, together <laughs> and yeah i mean the fact that even the day that we got engaged was the most annoyed with each other that we had been really and and that was the that was the point for me that it was like okay if this is the worst that it gets, then she's perfect. I mean, yeah, I'm sure going through life there will be more struggles and this and that, but, but really, I mean, spending a year in some very stressful situations, um, but really just, just having someone that can do that for you and go through those things and stride with you and come out on the positive end is, you know, that's, that's really... That's all you can ask for. beneficial thing. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Austin, Leah, thank you so much for thank spending you. some time with us and telling your stories. Where can people find you if they want to learn more about your adventure? Definitely. So um, we do have a blog. It's forerunner4adventure.com. Um, we, we, we're not really writers. 
uh, if you look at the blog, we're technically But there's some still good in... information. Like just, uh, yeah. we, we're trying to add more packing lists. Uh, we found that like we wanted to have that information for other travelers, but there's all kinds of things about the cars, solar panel stuff. Um, yeah. And then a little bit about our journey. Um, but then on Instagram, uh, Austin is continually posting some of our now weekend warrior kind of trips, and that's uh, at Forerunner for Adventure too. Yeah, a little bit of some of the some of the old stuff I'll put on there every now and then, and then we also have a, a Facebook as yeah. well. So, um, but yeah, really. We can't wait to follow you guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're excited. Learned a, learned a lot of lessons by you know, talking to Austin while I was with him at Turtleback, and it's awesome. So little different scenario but still a lot of the same principles apply and I think nice. through our discussion here is you know the positive attitude you know we've been we've been homeless for nine weeks now ten weeks now but really this last stretch when we finally left from our final preparation stages and it was real it's been one of the toughest times relationally you sure. know we're trying to follow that routine and there's there's that there's definitely some uh, some friction there until you get all those kinks worked out. And so I really appreciate what you had to say about having a positive attitude and, and always looking for, for the silver lining in whatever the circumstance is because whether you're traveling full time or just living life, having that outlook, it changes everything. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciate you guys taking the time to, to tell us your story and drop those little pearls of wisdom on us. All right, guys. All thanks right. for thanks for spending some time with us. Absolutely. Thank thanks for having us. <laughs>